Okay, well, thank you, and welcome to all. Um, thank you, Liz, for this um, introduction. What I'd like to do is uh, basically reflect on the, on the question that has been uh, asked to us in order to introduce uh, the, the discussion. And let me first remind, perhaps, the audience, although this will not be news for most of you, why the organizers chose to focus on supply chains and on the question of the bargaining position of um, small scale farmers in the supply chains and more generally um, in, on the governance of, of the food chains um, in the food systems. The reason why this topic is hugely important today is a very simple, uh, simple one. It is that out of the one billion people who are hungry today, the majority are actually producing food. Um, and essentially, um, they constitute, for uh, the most part, small-scale, independent uh, food producers, farmers, um, artisanal fishers, small herders. Altogether, these represent some 2 billion people in the world, and about 500 million are considered to be in a situation of food insecurity. They are hungry. And then we have, in addition to those about 500 million people who are hungry, we have a large number of agricultural workers um, employed as waged workers on, on large plantations. Altogether, 450 million people are employed in that capacity, and it is estimated that maybe 200 million of them are um, not sufficiently well paid to feed themselves in dignity. And for this reason, rebalancing the food systems so that they can work more equitably is absolutely key to combating hunger in the world today. And this is why it is very important, as um, we do today in this provocation, to move from a macro approach to hunger, which is focusing on, on volumes, on prices, uh, on the relationship between supply and, and needs, move from that macro level to the micro level, where we study the questions of power relationships in the, in the food chains and the governance of food chains. Indeed, I would suggest that even the urban poor, who are um, a growing um, number of, of the um, hungry people in the world, even them have been victims of a process of development that has essentially worked against the interests of the um, rural poor, they are most often people who migrated from the countryside to the cities in search of better living conditions, better employment. So even though not all those who are hungry today are people who depend on, on agriculture, it is nevertheless there that um, we have to uh, focus our efforts. And it is by reviving um, uh, agriculture and, and rural development that we can achieve some sustainable success in combating hunger. At the same time, we cannot simply focus on the question of smallholders. Um, and integrating smallholders in the markets is not sufficient if we don't take into account the phenomenon of urbanization and the needs of the urban poor. Nor can we ignore that most of the poor farmers are net food buyers who are very badly impacted by high prices which they may not be able to afford. And I will return to this issue, but I would simply like to, to add this nuance and the need to study how to support smallholders with the need to answer the question how to um, feed the urban populations. Now the question to us is rights-based versus market-based development. False dichotomy um, um, for small-scale farmers, um, question mark. And I believe this is a false dichotomy. I think uh, that a rights-based approach is one that means that we focus on the most vulnerable, that we define clearly the entitlements of each individual so that he or she may claim his or her rights. It is an approach that em emphasizes accountability and access to remedies. It is one that emphasizes non-discrimination and participation. And based on these human rights principles, what we have to do is think of how to organize markets, how to organize supply chains in order that they comply with these um, requirements of human rights. And to do this, we have to de-fetishize the market, to imagine other ways of organizing the market and ways to make it more inclusive 
and more and more resilient. Um, and that is what I would like to um, to try to explore a bit further. Now, to do this, I think it's important to understand what, over the past 30 years, the vicious cycle of hunger has been. What we've seen is a neglect of agriculture and particularly a squeezing out of small-scale farmers, as a result of which many of them migrated to the cities, many hired their workforce on large plantations and abandoned um, their farming, which was not sufficiently viable. As a result of this, many governments in developing countries have had no choice but to import low-priced foods which they dumped on the local markets, making it even more difficult for small farmers to make a decent living of farming. And so further, uh, making these people desperate and accelerating then um, rural flight, rural migration. So that is the vicious cycle we've been seeing over the past 30 years, particularly in many countries of sub-Saharan sub Africa and in large parts of South Asia. To break this vicious cycle, we need to, um, as I said, move beyond the macro level of the volumes and prices and um, try to address two separate concerns. Um, increase the incomes of small farmers and thus contribute to rural development. And secondly, ensure that food is affordable for the urban poor. And how to do this? Well, I believe there should be perhaps three priorities, three directions in which to think. First, and I'm sure that many of us will insist on this point, we have to better organize farmers in order to allow them to capture a higher portion of the value uh, of what they produce, for example, by promoting uh, cooperatives that could allow them to, to package, to process, to market their food and basically benefit more from their from the work as food producers. Secondly, we need to create local food markets linking farmers to the urban dwellers and linking the countryside to the cities um, by using a, a value chains approach, if you wish, a, 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 organizing the linkages between uh, the cities and the countryside. For example, ensuring that food can be transported um, and conserved um, so that it can feed the cities when produced in the countryside. Organizing farmers markets, um, training farmers, um, preferably through cooperatives, training them in management skills, in marketing skills. Um, we must also encourage what I would like to call a reverse nutrition transition teach the urban dwellers that they may feed themselves better with more nutritious foods that are more locally produced and that are fresh foods rather than relying, as they do often today, on, um, um, uh, on, on refined, um, uh, uh, imported, um, less fresh foods which are um, imported from, from abroad. We have to link the local farmers to the local food pro processors and to the local food providers such as um, those uh, catering in, in hotels and, and restaurants. That is the second priority, create local food markets, local food systems. And the third priority is to plan a multi-year strategy that will allow developing countries where food insecurity is um, important to essentially shift away from their addiction to cheap food dumped on the international markets by um, um, OECD countries in particular and large um, uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural superpowers and um, allow these countries to become more self-sufficient in, in, in feeding themselves. Today, the least developed countries, they spend some 20% um, of, uh, or, or rather they import some 20% of the food that they consume and their food bills is very significantly um, increasing over the past few years, not just in absolute terms, but also in percentage of the GDP. And so we need to move in parallel towards improving the ability of farmers to produce and to meet local needs and improving the social protection of the urban poor in order to allow them to uh, buy the food that they need to feed themselves in dignity. Hunger is, of course, the result of poverty. But it is more the result of um, a lack of purchasing power amongst the poor than it is the result of high prices per se. High prices are a problem in other terms because the urban poor are not supported by social protection schemes. In this context, I believe that markets have a role to play 
but we should not focus on global supply chains. We should focus on local and regional markets that may be more promising, particularly for landlocked countries, for example, which have no adequate um, uh, um, communication infrastructures that make them their imports more, more expensive and make it more difficult for them to, to export and for whom, therefore, um, global supply chains may not be the best option. At the same time, to the extent that global supply chains um, will continue to exist and perhaps even in certain contexts to develop, we must make them more inclusive and more resilient. More inclusive by reshaping them in order to allow small-scale farmers to benefit from them. This means cooperatives. It also means helping small farmers to comply with um, food safety standards and quality standards. It means also improving access to credit, information about prices, uh, for example. But we need especially to build, and I close with this, um, uh, the resilience uh, of, these, uh, of these supply chains. And by this I mean two things. First, in many cases these supply chains are organized through contract farming, by which one commodity buyer supports producers to produce certain crops and um, uh, the producer therefore uh, sells those crops to the, um, uh, the buyer with whom a long-term agreement has been concluded. Now, I believe that there may be a need to regulate contract farming to ensure that the risks are equitably balanced between the two parties, that, for example, small farmers do not um, uh, fall into very heavy um, um, indebtedness as a result of having to, to borrow to, to buy the inputs which they need to produce. And we need to ensure that the switch, the switch to cash crops um, and the abandonment of food crops by these small farmers will not be a, a radical one. Um, when a farmer switches to, to cash crops, it means that the family becomes increasingly dependent on the evolution of prices on the markets because, of course, they have to buy all the food that they consume since they are not producing food for themselves. It also means that within the family, within the household, the woman loses um, the decision-making power that it has when the family produces its own food. And so we need to be very careful um, when incentivizing farmers to switch through contract farming to cash crops that uh, this is not uh, a switch that goes too far. And I believe we could um, create incentives so that they continue to produce some food uh, for themselves. And finally, resilience should also be resilience against um, climate shocks, against um, 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 uh, the, the, the attacks of nature. I believe that one major challenge that we are facing today, and I, I really close with this, is um, how to reconcile the need for more diversity on the farm, the combination of plants, trees and small animals so that the farms can produce their own inputs in a way that mimics nature instead of the industrial processes. How to reconcile this agroecological type of farming which we very urgently need to meet the challenges of the future, particularly in the context of climate change, how to reconcile this with the demands of supply chains that require uniformity, that require um, stability of supply, and that may be very difficult to reconcile with um, eco-farming. I believe that diversity should be promoted. I believe that um, the cost of farming should be lowered by having farmers less reliant on external inputs, but it is to me still an open question whether this can be reconciled with integrating uh, the farmers into large supply chains. Thank you very much.